what you're going to see tonight is the story of that day as told by the people who were there, the eyewitnesses. No secondhand accounts and no conspiracy theories. Just what they saw. Take a look. There's Mrs. Kennedy and the crowd yells and the President of the United States. Shaking hands now with the Dallas people, smiling, secret service men all around. Boy, this is something. November 22nd, 1963, beautiful day in Dallas. Dallas was very exciting. Kennedy, when he got off the plane, ignored the guidelines on the tarmac and he started towards the fence where the people were and he started shaking hands and I thought, hey, you know, this guy's in Nashville. So at the last minute, I thought, you know, I'm gonna go over and see the motorcade. I had been out in my district that morning downtown and came back to the office uh, for lunch to meet some other officers. So as the parade uh, came through downtown Dallas, uh, the officers that were in the office went out on the curb and we were standing there watching the parade. We started walking over and I kept looking up at the rooftops and I turned to my colleague and said, you know, if there were going to be an assassination attempt, it would probably be here. I have no idea why I said that. Car salesman James Tague was running late for a lunch date in downtown Dallas when he got stuck in traffic on Commerce Street, heading east into the center of the city. Got out of his car to see what was going on. He completely forgot the president was visiting and didn't realize the motorcade would be turning onto Elm Street just a few lanes away. This is the spot he was standing in when a shot was fired from the sixth floor of the book depository. One of the shots that was fired fragmented and a fragment of that bullet actually cut James Tague's face. Well, the first shot, the majority of people here thought it was either a firecracker or a motorcycle backfire. And with those thoughts going through my mind, then there was a crack, crack of two rifle shots, one right after the other. Something stung me in the face. And then a couple of seconds later, third shot. And that was a, a much more violent reaction. of the moment, I'm standing there wondering what just happened. Kennedy had gone violently to the left and then Jackie started screaming, oh my God, and turned around and got on the back seat and then started climbing out on the back of the limo. As I I came on across the grassy area between Main and Elm Street. Um, the presidential car was just entering the triple underpass. There were a couple of motorcycles on the street. One of the motorcycle officers had run up what's been referred to as the grassy knoll, and I went out into the freight yard. We waited for traffic to clear and cross over to what is known as the grassy knoll. And there's a policeman there talking to two men. We walked up just in time to hear one of the men sobbing. His head exploded, his head exploded. And the policeman says, whose head? He says, the president's. A cop got off his motorcycle and came towards me and some others and said, get down. I got down, I said, no, I gotta get up. I've gotta get to a phone. And I thought the nearest phone's gonna be in the depository building. So I ran along the sidewalk and ran up the steps and ran up through the doorway and the door was, there was a guy in the doorway. It was sort of half open. And I asked him where a phone was and he said, in there. I said, thank you and went in and 
got on the only phone in the lobby of the depository building and called the station and I said, you know, patch me through and leave the line open. Little did Allman know that the guy in the doorway was the president's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. Fellow reporter Hugh Ainsworth of the Dallas Morning News was the only journalist to witness what happened next. When Oswald went out of the building, he turned left and went four blocks up Elm Street, got on a bus. The bus stalled in traffic after two blocks, and he got out. He went two blocks south to the Greyhound bus station. There he found a taxi driver who took him to Oak Cliff, and he got his pistol. He changed his outfit and took off south for several blocks. Shortly after that is when law enforcement officials shifted their focus to the book depository building. Uh, they were searching each floor in the building. We had some large battery-powered flashlights. I took one and just happened to go to the sixth floor. One of the deputies that came to the sixth floor also found what's been referred to as the sniper's nest. I observed a couple of cases of books that stacked up by the window that could be used as a rifle rest. And there were three spent shells on the floor. As I got to the northwest corner of the building, there were two rows of books that were two cases high. The top row of books had been pushed across the top of the crevice so as to conceal the crevice. As I looked down and shined my light in the crevice between the two rows of books, I observed a, a rifle in there. I looked at my watch, it was 1.22 p.m. By this time, the Dallas police had put out an all-points bulletin on Oswald after an eyewitness described him. Officer J.D. Tippett was the one who spotted Oswald walking into the Oak Cliff neighborhood. He stopped Oswald, they talked for a few minutes, then Oswald shot him four times. Ainsworth was near the crime scene talking to eyewitnesses to the shooting. I went out of this one place and heard on the radio there's a suspect at the Texas theater. So I ran like mad to the theater. And I met the woman who was a ticket salesperson. She had a transistor radio up by her ear and she was crying. And she kept pointing, he's in there, he's in there. So I go in the theater and I saw them coming up the aisle toward me. Two plainclothes guys and two uniformed cops. Now as I stood there in the doorway, he was about 15 feet from me. Officer McDonald, Nick McDonald, was the one who got to him first. He told me later that Oswald stood up and said, well, it's all over now. 48 hours later, Dallas was still buzzing. That morning, Oswald was going to be transferred from the city jail to the county jail. We walked back in the office, and as I walked in the office and around the switchboard, the operator said, you have a phone call. And I went over to the telephone, and it was my wife, Charmaine, that was calling. She said, I've been watching this on TV, and it looks like Jack Ruby shot Oswald. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. Before I was a deputy sheriff, I was working for the Dallas Times Herald, handling all the theater and nightclub advertising in Dallas. And Jack Ruby was one of my clients. I said, no, it couldn't be Jack, but it was. I knew Jack Ruby for three years before he did his number. I did not like him. I saw him beat up people a couple times. He was not a nice man. He was a braggart. He wanted to have class, but he didn't really know what class meant. I believe that Jack thought that he could shoot Oswald, be the man that shot the man, you know, the code of the West, that no jury would ever convict him. He could go back to his carousel club and be the main attraction and have more business than he could ever win. This is the biggest, most horrible tragedy in the history of America. We had Pearl Harbor in 1941, but a lot of us didn't know about, we didn't even know where Pearl Harbor was. We had 9-11 later, but in, the, in those years ensuing, in between, this is the biggest tragedy, and nobody knew how to handle it. 